So welcome to Pelican Harbor Seabird Station's uh, 2021 webinar series, um, Rescuing Miami's Native Wildlife Since 1980. Our mission at Pelican Harbor Seabird Station is dedicated to the rescue, rehab, and release of sick, injured, or orphaned brown pelicans, seabirds, and other native wildlife, and the preservation and protection of these species through educational and scientific means. And the vision is, of course, as a trusted wildlife rehab center, Pelican Harbor Seabird Station embodies professionalism, compassion, and integrity. Through innovation, education, and outreach, we provide the highest quality of care to our patients while um, upholding the importance of conservation in the community. So this presentation is wildlife radiology. So we're gonna take a closer look at some of the cases seen at Pelican Harbor Seabird Station in 2021 and more. So, you know, what, what do we use x-rays for in wildlife rehabilitation? I think a lot of people are very familiar with um, ingestion of, of hooks in seabirds. It was the cover of the webinar advertisement and uh, something that most people are pretty familiar with and hopefully uh, pretty easy to see on an x-ray as well. But let me show you in here, we have a little hook up in the esophagus area and then a bunch of hooks in the stomach. Um, and right off the bat, I can tell you birds are very unique. We'll see all kinds of unique features of birds throughout the presentation. And one of their uh, unique features is their, their two stomach system. So they have the proventriculus where a lot of that enzymatic activity happens and the ventriculus, which is the, some people know as the gizzard, the, the stomach that grinds. And these hooks tend to get stuck in the proventriculus and um, if they cannot be manually removed, then we have to go in surgically and take them out, which um, luckily they, they tend to get stuck in the proventriculus. It's a little bit of an easier surgery, but we try to avoid that when we can. So, um, you know, unfortunately, you sort of have to understand what an x-ray is before we go into a whole uh, presentation about it. So this is from the Veterinary Information Network, and I won't torture you with reading all of it, but basically it's a black and white two-dimensional image of a part of the inside of the body, and radiation goes through the structure or the part of the body, and then it leaves an image um, in the old days, <laughs> old days, some people still, still use x-ray films, but um, I haven't used one in years. The x-ray film is what would sort of capture like a, in photography, the way that you, you capture light. So the denser the tissue is like bone, the whiter it is on the film. And then if it's less dense, like air in the lungs um, or, or liquids, then it'll allow more of the radiation to pass through the film and it leaves the area black. So of course, in the last 10 years or so, a lot of private practices are using digital radiography. And the principles do remain the same, but now, you know, it's going on to a, basically it's a digital recording and it goes onto a computer screen. So you avoid the need of the x-ray film, which is lovely because it's easy to share them, to store them. In wildlife, we can email images to each other very quickly and get a consultation. We can share them on the veterinary information network and get feedback from our colleagues. Um, it's a wonderful tool. If Dr. Gagard or I are not at Pelly Harbor Super Station, the text can send us an image um, very quickly after it's taken and we can take a look at it even if we're not on property and give some advice. So whether on film or digital, radiography is really the most common and readily available imaging test in the veterinary practice. Um, maybe one day we'll be doing MRIs and CAT scans on, on wildlife on the regular. Right now it's not really financially feasible, but it's a wonderful tool for evaluating size and shape of organs, um, looking for broken bones, foreign objects such as the hooks that we just saw, fluid, all kinds of things. So we will dive into that more. And before I continue, I have to say that the digital radiography that we use at Pelican Harbor Seabird Station was made possible by the Deeks Foundation, uh, thanks to their generous gift. And we are all so very grateful for that because it makes our life easier. So this is a, a shot of Tori and Yuritza in action, um, doing an x-ray of a bird. And you can sort of see the, the top box is the, the tube where the the radiation comes out of, and then there's, a, it's not an x-ray film because it's digital, but a plate that basically cam captures the images and sends it to the computer screen. And you can see that it's a little bird on the table and it's got a mask on its face because it's getting some gas anesthesia. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And I do have to mention on this slide, if you have not been inside of the Pelican Harbor Seabird Station Hospital, it's a really small space. And the team is so fantastic at utilizing 
every square inch of the place, the table that the x-ray is being taken off gets tucked away in a laundry room when not in use. And you would never even know it was there. And everything's got its little corner and spot that it lives. And I feel like the staff at Pelly Harbor Seaver Station could all manage in a tiny house very easily because they're so excellent at all of this. <laughs> so big kudos to the team. So um, what kind of patients are we doing radiographs of? Basically any species can get a radiograph. I haven't had to deal with fish in, in the wildlife world, but in private practice, I have taken x-rays of fish. And in case you're wondering, how do you take an x-ray of a fish? Well, if it's small enough, you put it in a Ziploc bag with water from its tank and you lay it on the table in the Ziploc bag and get a beautiful image, which is super fun. Uh, there's no real size limitation. There's nothing too small. I've done birds as small as six grams and then animals as large as 60 kilograms, which is well over 120 pounds. Uh, most often, like I said, we are screening for hooks or fishing line. We often look for fractures. We're looking for soft tissue trauma or damage to the joints that you know you can't see from the outside. Sometimes we're looking for a fungal infection, such as aspergillus species, especially in the raptors, and often just collecting general information. So here's another example of you know that bird with the hook that was on the cover to show a common use of X-ray. So um, some things to know about radiology in wildlife. So first of all, the patients are often very, very stressed and taking an x-ray of a hawk awake is very different than taking an x-ray of a pet cat awake because they're not used to being handled in that way. The whole situation is very stressful for them. And um, while stress does not per se kill an animal, we do want to decrease their stress as much as possible because what it does is it creates that flight or fight response and the, they're you know, increasing production of hormones that can kind of bring down their immune system. And it also just makes them uncomfortable. So we wanna to try to use anesthesia as much as possible to do x-rays of um, wildlife patients. But then you have to ask yourself, was well, the patient stable enough for anesthesia? So it's kind of a balancing act. Um, if they are stable enough, we often sedate with a, a gas, isoflurane or sevoflurane or sometimes injectables, um, things like alfaxalone or a mixture of butorphanol and midazolam. If you have no idea what these things are, it's fine. You just have to know that it's an injection that takes the edge off and makes them a little bit sleepy and more relaxed for their x-ray. Um, the other part of it is positioning. To get a good x-ray, the animals have to be in a good position. And many of our x-rays are just what we call a plop x-ray. So they're kind of put on the table, either wrapped in a towel or held down or in a box just to do some screening. But when you want something more specific with a better technique, there's different tricks and tips for getting a good thoracic girdle view, which is the sort of um, neck, neck to heart area, which I'll talk about more later. Sometimes for wing tips, their hips, spine, skull, all of the techniques will vary. So sometimes when they're sedated, we'll use masking tape to put them in a good position or sometimes we wear our protective gowns and hold the patient. So this is um, me in action, safety first. So I have my, my lead apron on, the gown to protect me from radiation, my neck shield, I'm wearing my badge because we all have our amount of radiation we're exposed to recorded. And of course, because we're in COVID-19 times, I have my mask on. All right, so a little bit more technical stuff and then I promise we won't do any more of that. But there's a couple of, well, there's three big things when you take an X-ray. You have your milliampere seconds, your kilovoltage peak, and then the time of exposure. So what does this even mean? So the milliamperes is basically the number of electrons that are generated in that tube. So the more electrons you have, the more radiation. The more radiation you have, the more density you see. And then the time in that uh, is the S and that's the electrons that are produced in a certain amount of time. So sometimes we need more of that, especially in like in a bigger animal with big thick bones. And then the kilovoltage is basically what, what helps those electrons travel from the tube to the table. So imagine like a battery with a positive and a negative, that kind of thing. And it's the kilovoltage peak is where you, they get the the speed and the strength to go across. So it ensures that you have penetration and exposure. So you wanna basically accelerate those electrons and ensure it's a sufficient amount of exposure and contrast to be able to read your X-ray. So yes, I apologize if you're all snoozing, oh, brings me back to vet school days, but we had to get that out of the way so that anybody who is taking X-rays understands a little bit of what's going on there. 
So this is a common grackle. Uh, it's got the mask on its face, getting the gas anesthesia. It's nicely taped down to get a nice position. We have our right and left marker. And here we used um, 7.8 MAS, we used 52 KVP, and the time was 0 0.260. And that produced a nice x-ray for a little bird. So what I would say is anybody who is doing these in the rehab world and you want advice on the settings, it's really about your own machine. And it's really important to keep a log of the x-rays and the settings that you use for the species so that over time you learn what works the best. And the beautiful thing about wildlife is most of your x-rays are gonna end up with the same settings over time because a lot of them are such similar patients. So this image is courtesy of uh, Long Beach Animal Hospital. Their website had a lot of beautiful x-ray pictures with labeling. Um, so it's an avian radiograph and um, the bird is on its back, not on its side. And it just shows us the general position of the major organs. So the heart, the lungs, the liver and lots of air sacs. So let's go back to our main principles. So when the radiation goes through, if it's not dense tissue, it comes out very black. And if it's dense tissue, it comes out white. So birds are just incredible because they're full of air everywhere. Why? To fly. So they wanna stay lightweight. So birds have lungs, but they also have these air sacs all throughout their body. And we'll see in some of the other x-rays, even in their bones, there's a lot of air. So bird x-rays will often look very different than mammal. And it's really important to understand these general principles and the places. So this was from a veterinary partner. And I loved how they use the colors to out outline everything. Um, the image on my left, but I'm facing, well, here I've got my laser. So in this image, you can see what we call the cardiohepatic silhouette. So this is the heart of the bird and then it comes down to the liver. So it's called the cardiohepatic silhouette. And it would, it would just blow your mind to know how different this is from one species of bird to the next. So there's so many little nuances that we have to learn as we go through this, um, but it's really neat. If you compare a Cooper's hawk to a parrot, to a warbler, they're all very different and you have to know what's normal for any given species. Uh, over here, they've sort of outlined with color some of this major stuff. So your lungs are uh, what's in blue, and then you have your heart and your, your liver lives over here. And then this is sort of your, your proventriculus, ventriculus, and all of the intestinal stuff here. But you can just see all this air everywhere. It's amazing. And now the bird is on its side. So the same general idea, this is the heart over here. And of course, these are all bones that we'll get into a little more later. And you have the air and the air sacs. There's some vessels coming out of the heart. And, and look at all this in here. It almost looks like little rocks. And that would be totally normal because as we know, birds have that gizzard or ventriculus. And so here it is outlined down here. And so it would be normal. If this was somewhere else in the bird's x-ray, then we would be a little bit worried because it would be the wrong place to have that kind of stuff. Oh, and another fascinating thing, this yellow feature here is actually the kidneys of the bird. So bird's kidneys, oops, apologies. The bird's kidneys are always like along their back and they're um, called trilobed because there's three different lobes in them. So even on an x-ray, if there's something really wrong with the kidneys or they're very enlarged, those will show up and just absolutely completely different than anything you would ever know about mammals. So all of these species are very, very different. And as we all know, Pelican Harbor Seabird Station sees all kinds of species every year. So lots of fun for us to stay on top of our game. So you probably wonder how does a bird swallow a hook this enormous? I mean, this thing is absolutely massive. Um, it's almost big enough to be an alligator hook, which are outlawed in the state of Florida. I'm not sure if it's thick enough. And I apologize, I didn't take this particular x-ray so I can't confirm if it is. But because hook and line are one of the main reasons for presentation of um, wildlife patients and why we x-ray them, I did wanna mention in this presentation that it's our job to really educate people about this you know, if people are fishing to not cut the line if they get a bird because they end up flying away with the hook and the line and they can get additional injuries, that it's super important to reel the bird in and seek assistance right away and to use the monofilament recycling bins that are available at most of the piers. And then of course, alligator hooks are not legal. So um, if anybody is using those, they shouldn't. But how the bird swallows this is basically when it's enveloped in that smooth, fish, it just slides down real easily. And then once it's in there, it's really hard for them to get it back up. So there's three different ways that we can do this sort of hook removal in the birds. 
One is um, through feeding them fish that has cotton in it. And then the hook gets embedded in the cotton. And after a few days, the bird actually regurgitates the cotton and the hook comes out. Or we can sedate the bird and reach in with our hand if it's a big enough bird and pull the hook out manually. And then if all else fails, that's when the bird goes to surgery, which is of course something that we want to avoid. So enough about hook and line. I thought it would be fun to take a look at some of the cases that we've seen just this year at, at Pelican Harbor. Um, they have years and years of data and years and years of x-rays, but these are cases that I'm relatively familiar with and um, are very relevant and recent. So uh, some of you may even know who they are as we go through these. Uh, but this particular osprey, number 0190, presented in February with a pretty bad chest wound um, and x-rays were taken. And you'll see in a second that there was a pellet noted. It had an injured wing, um, which is one of the reasons that we had to do x-rays. And just as a side note, we treated this animal with pain medications, laser therapy, antibiotics, and the wing was in fact wrapped. So here we go. This is one of its x-rays. And right over here, this very bright structure is in fact a pellet. And you would be amazed at how many birds and even reptiles present with pellets. And I think if we x-rayed all of them, it would be even more than we thought. Um, at one time when iguanas were, were rampant in South Florida at one of my other jobs, we ended up x-raying all iguanas and found about 90% of them had pellet in their body, even if it's not what they presented for because people were shooting them. So it is something that we actually report to US Fish and Wildlife on our annual report. Anytime we have a bird with a pellet, we sort of flag it and put it in the shot bird section. And it just helps to collect some data. So even if this bird had had nothing else wrong with it, the x-ray helps us to collect data for the overall sort of evaluation of, of patients um, in the country. But unfortunately, this bird also had, what you can see over here, a fracture of what we call the ulna. So if you remember, I said birds have a million fascinating things about their bodies that help them adapt to flight. Um, on our forearm, our radius is our bigger bone. For birds, the ulna is the bigger bone. And this bone articulates with the wrist and with the elbow. So whenever a bird has a fracture of a long bone, the key is to immobilize the joint above and below where the fracture is to allow for healing. So that's just sort of one of our general principles. So when we wrap this, we wanna make sure that the wrist and the elbow have no movement at all during the time of healing. But then because they're birds of prey, we still wanna make sure that when they're done everything, they're gonna have excellent range of motion and good flight. So we have to balance everything with physical therapy. So it's truly an art form. Now in this um, image, I'm showing you what's called a skyline view. So remember when I was talking about radiographs, it's a two-dimensional image. The problem is a two-dimensional image doesn't tell you what's going on. You really need a 3D image. And so to do that, we do multiple views of anything that we're looking at. And the problem with a bird wing is if you do the bird on its back or on its side, the wing ends up kind of looking the same in both views. So somebody really bright decided to do what we call the skyline view. And um, it provides a new angle and a new way to look at the bone. So you can just see here how the ulna is absolutely shattered in this area. So the cortex, which is the outside of the bone is in multiple little fragments here. And um, we wouldn't have been able to see that without this beautiful skyline view. So, uh, I apologize that you probably can't read the writing, but the idea is it's a really funky position where the bird is being held sort of with its legs up and its butt down and its wing extended out and then rotated a little bit to get this skyline view. And any rehabbers who aren't using this in their practice yet when their veterinarian takes x-rays should really add it because it provides that extra view to get the three-dimensional image of the wing. So um, moving on to a, a much smaller bird, we had a Northern Mockingbird presented in August. Um, when I examined it, the complaint was that the, the wings were splayed. Now remember when these birds are this tiny at 28 grams, they're just sort of sitting in the nest and you don't expect them to be standing perching very much. They sit and gape all day begging for food. Um, but there was a, a palpation of the legs that made us think that maybe the, the legs were broken or bent in some way. 
So of course we did a radiograph. And here we go again with our, our special things about birds. So these are the femur bones, which are basically like our thigh bones. And the only reason this one looks so weird is because of positioning and because we weren't really focusing on the femur. But this is what we call the tibia tarsus in the bird. So here we go again, birds having different bones than mammals because they have used many of their bones to stay more lightweight for flight. So instead of having a tibia, which is like our shin bone and a tarsus, which is like our foot bone, they have this tibia tarsus, which is fused and it's really a long bone in them. And this poor baby bird probably fell out of a nest and broke not one, but both of its legs. So in an attempt to do everything possible, we used uh, two needles. Um, I believe they were 25 gauge needles. So you can see the top of the needle here and they were inserted into the top of the tibia bone on each leg, of course, with the bird under anesthesia and with pain medications on board to try to line up the fractures and stabilize them. Now, remember the X-ray is only a two dimensional image. So to make sure that these pins were in the right place, we did our lateral view as well. And here you can see that it's filled the long bone. So there's our, what we call the knee or the stifle in a bird. And there's the hawk, which for us would be like the ankle and it's filling that long bone. And the idea is to keep the bone stable during the healing process. Now the pins help you line up the bones, but the bone at the fracture site can actually still rotate. So to prevent rotational forces, we still had to put bandages on the bird's leg. So I think that was the last image of that one. But I did wanna mention that another use for x-rays is um, to see if when we place an intraosseous catheter in a bird, if it actually was put in the right position. So what is an intraosseous catheter? Well, basically I'm sure you've all heard of IV catheters, IV fluids. Now imagine you have a 28 gram bird and you wanna give it IV fluids. Impossible, right? There's no vein big enough to put a catheter in. So what we can do is actually put a catheter into that tibiotarsal bone and you can actually administer intraosseous fluids and some medications instead of IV. So it's a really cool technique that can be life-saving for birds, um, especially if their blood pressure is too low to get an IV into a vein and you really need to deliver life-saving fluids or medications. And then you can take a quick X-ray to make sure that your catheter is actually in the right place of the bone. So that was just a little side note about another use of catheters. This is another fun little case um, that presented at Pelican Harbor this year. Uh, July 5th, this little possum came in at only 40 grams. And then five days later, uh, when an intern or a volunteer was uh, feeding the baby possum, they felt a strange little mass on its abdomen and thought that maybe one of the veterinarians should take a look at it. So we basically um, did some radiographs and it was a little bit unclear exactly what was going on. So in order to get more definition, we decided to do uh, what's called a, a barium meal. So I will sh talk a little bit more about that and then go back to the outcome of this case. And um, basically barium is what you use to do a contrast radiograph. So it's like a dry white chalky powder that you mix with water to create a liquid or a paste and it coats the gastrointestinal tract. And then it becomes an x-ray absorber. So it brightens anything that it touches on the x-ray. So it's really used for um, a lot of gastrointestinal imaging and um, doesn't have a huge place in wildlife medicine, but certainly in this case, you will see in a second uh, when we do use it. So this possum, uh, the day that I palpated it was given one ml of barium and the x-ray was taken only 10 minutes later. And you can see how the barium coats the esophagus and the stomach, but even more interesting, you can see how what should be in the gastrointestinal tract is coming up over where the bones of this animal are. So if we go to another view, this one is a little bit more stunning. So the stomach is on the left side of animals. So here we have our left marker to show us that this is the left side and the barium has filled the stomach here. And you can see that the stomach is poking way out. So this is that mass that the intern was feeling and then this is all the 
the barium filling the stomach. So now we know that this animal has a hernia because the stomach is not where it's supposed to be. So um, at the whopping weight of 80 grams, we did surgery on this possum to correct the hernia. And after surgery, we gave it barium again. And as you can see um, by where the arrow is pointing, now everything is well within the abdominal wall where it should be. And you can actually see because this x-ray was taken after surgery, all of this barium has made its way down to the colon. And just a little side note, while we're on a mammal instead of a bird, you can really see some striking differences in the overall x-ray. I mean, you know, the skull of course is completely different. We have teeth now, we have ears, um, we have boule of the ears. We have this much uh, more compact chest. Mammals actually have a diaphragm, which birds don't have. So we have a clear separation of the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So, so many exciting things to see on every x-ray. And then um, just for fun, I asked them yesterday to take a new x-ray of, of this uh, possum. So Dr. Gagard and the team gave it uh, barium. Now it's much closer to 200 grams, a much bigger animal. And you can see that the stomach is now nicely where it's supposed to be. It's not sticking out all over the place and the barium is filling it very nicely. The possum is eating well, its incision is healed and now it gets to be with all of its possum friends and prepare for release. Okay, so moving back to uh, another bird case. This was a Cooper's hawk that presented in June, um, it had a lot of blood in its mouth and it had a fracture of the leg. So clearly a trauma case. Uh, it had an awake x-ray done when it came in because it was not terribly stable and they were able to see that the tibia tarsus was fractured. So here we go again with, um, I'm sorry, the tarsometatarsus is fractured. The tibia tarsus is here and this is the femur, and now we have another fused bone, which is the tarsometatarsus. So instead of having a tarsus and metatarsals like in mammals, it's fused into one bone in birds, again, to keep us on our toes and always having to stay on top of all these anatomical differences from one species to the next. But you can see this fracture very clearly. There's a little bit of swelling here. So they did what's called external co-optation, which is when you put a just a splint or a bandage instead of doing a surgical correction. And then to follow up to complete the view, because as we know, you need two views to really see the whole thing. Um, there was a lateral done a few days later. You can see that the, the splint is in place. And so the splint, you know, the goal is to immobilize the joint above and the joint below, which is the foot. And you can see this whole healing process going on. Now, the amazing thing with birds is that when they break a bone, it heals so much faster than mammals, like weeks instead of months. And basically the way it works is a huge callus is formed. So the callus is thick and bright on the x-ray. And what that is, is it's those osteoblasts creating lots and lots of bony cells to allow for healing. Then over time, the osteoclasts come in and they break up the callus and remodel the bone into normal shape. So one of the things we do when birds have a broken bone is we follow them with x-rays periodically to see where they're at in the healing process. All right, um, this bird, I chose this picture not because it's one that we had, it's actually a picture of a different bird, but it really does look like a troublemaker Cooper's hawk. And I'm very angry with this Cooper's hawk right now because um, we have done everything for this bird and he's done nothing but cause us trouble. So this picture is courtesy of National Geographic, but to me really depicts our Cooper's Hawk 211298 very well. Because ours presented uh, July 5th with head trauma, unable to stand, walking like a drunk, so we call that ataxia. Um, and he, res he resolved his, his head trauma quite nicely. He got laser and anti-inflammatories. He was very mildly ataxic, not walking like a total drunk, just a little tipsy. Um, and we managed to move him to an outdoor mew after a couple of weeks, but he just wouldn't fly well. So when he first came in on July 5th, x-rays were taken and there was no orthopedic findings. And then um, on July 13th, they did x-rays again because he still wasn't flying well. And I was a little concerned about some of this 
white stuff up at the base of the heart. I was like, oh, maybe this hawk has aspergillus, which is a fungal infection. And it, it looks like truly like mold inside of their bodies, these poor birds when they get fungal infections. So we sent out blood for a complete blood count because birds that have aspergillus have very high white counts and it came back normal. So we said, well, maybe he just needs some more time. So August 12th, he still got in perfect flight. And now when we're feeling the wing, there was a very limited extension at this wrist here. And I said, well, this wrist looks a little odd. Let's compare right to left, which is something we do a lot in these birds. All right, so now we're in our, our normal left wing because we're comparing the left to the right. And I wanna show you something really fun. I keep showing you fun things about birds. So you're gonna, if you don't already love birds, you're gonna love birds even more. So this is the alula on the birds. It's a very tiny little bone that comes off of what we call sort of their wrist. So this would be the equivalent of our hands, which of course they've done that cool fusion thing again to make themselves lightweight. And you can see all of their main feathers are coming off of here. And the alula is actually a really important bone on these birds, even though it's super tiny, because it really sort of helps them to like stop in flight. Um, it helps them to kind of do this flip motion. So when you look on the plane, when the sides go up, um, that's kind of what the alula does. So on this left, it's absolutely perfect. Now, when we go back to the right and look at it again, I can see that the, the base where the alula attaches to, it's just lost that clarity. Now, the frustrating thing is this was not here on July 5th. And we even had the Cooper's hawk on volume throughout its stay in the hospital because we know that Cooper's hawks are always crazy. They flap about in the cage, they're very hyper. So we gave him Valium and he still must have banged his wrist in the cage hard enough for this to happen. So I'm gonna attempt to go back again. So the original X-ray on arrival, this right Alula is perfectly normal. The left is perfectly normal. And then somewhere between then and July 13th, he gets all this swelling here from banging it around. And then here we are, with this sort of like tipped over bone. It's just not quite in the right place. So basically what we have to do now is, you know, do some physical therapy, uh, do laser therapy, try to get that extension of the wrist normal again so that we can ultimately release the bird. Like this Cooper's hawk was, this is not the same bird. <laughs> the bird is still in the hospital, but this is the desired outcome. So that's what we're working towards. But I share that case because you would think that tiny little bone, it's kind of like if you broke your, your pinky in terms of size, how could it do so much damage? But these birds are precision flyers. They need to be able to stop and steer and get lift and do all those beautiful things. So the x-rays are super, super important for us to be able to evaluate their progress and, you know, make a, a proper diagnosis. So this is an example of a coracoid fracture. It's super, super common for us to have birds that fly into windows. And if you don't know what a coracoid is, it's basically the bone that birds have that we don't have that's behind the clavicle, which is the wishbone. Uh, basically, birds need so much muscle for that big flight, especially in that shoulder to chest area, that they have the clavicles in front, the coracoids behind, and it all supports all these muscles that attach to their keel, which is the long sort of front bone, kind of like our sternum, but for birds. So when they bash into a window, they usually either break the clavicle or the coracoid. So this is sort of the far part of the coracoid, what we call the distal fragment. And then the proximal fragment is over here. They're just like not even next to each other. And this is very, very common. A lot of times they present with a wing droop because now everything's being pulled down. And luckily, if we just do a good wing wrap to stabilize it for a couple of weeks, a lot of these heal just with rest and a little body wrap. And again, fun techniques for all these special things with birds, this is called an H view. So what it does is, um, this is a picture of a picture of a picture. So you can't see the clarity here, but what you can see is the bird is on its back, but instead of like a normal X-ray where the legs are down, we've actually lifted the, the butt of the bird up off the table so that 
everything goes down this way and you get the clarity that you need of the clavicles, coracoids and scapula bones, which all encompass the thoracic girdle. So I apologize if this is way too much information, but I just, this stuff blows me away. I can't believe everything that we've come up with over the years. All right, so this one was super fun. Um, this is, well, before I say it, you can guess in your mind, what species is this? Obviously it's a bird, but look at the beak and about the general size. And basically this was another trauma case. You can see a fracture here, a fracture here, and then there's also a fracture of the mandible on the other side. So if you didn't guess it, it's a double crested cormorant and um, time will tell if this will heal to where the bird can eat on its own. That's gonna be sort of the deciding factor for releasability. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, this is another fun one. It's, it's a plop x-ray that I've already talked about of it and Hinga. Um, but I just love how it shows that, that thoracic girdle area so well and clear, even though it was just a plop x-ray. And um, you might be wondering where did his head go? <laughs> well, sometimes we sort of wrap them up to keep them comfortable. And, they, and hingas have, are sometimes called snake birds because of their long snaky neck. So if you follow it all the way down, his, his beak is basically where his tail is. <laughs> So just a fun one to show. We were really just looking for, for hooks, but um, sometimes they come out real neat. And then I couldn't do a presentation without at least one uh, turtle. So here's an Eastern box turtle. Um, he presented originally for, for fractures and the repair was done. Um, Dr. Gagar did a beautiful repair here with screws and wires. Uh, again, obviously with strong pain medication and deep sedation uh, because we're very kind to our patients. But what I wanted to show you on this x-ray was another use for x-rays is sometimes to confirm a feeding tube placement. So if you follow this, so this is where we enter the food and liquid to feed this animal. But if you follow the tube, it goes down, around, and what we're trying to make sure is, did it make it to the stomach? And there it is. So. Feeding tubes are critical for turtles that aren't eating. A lot of turtles don't eat when they're inside, especially water turtles because they eat in the water. And sometimes we have to dry dock them to manage these um, fractures, which was obviously the more obvious problem in this patient. But I thought it was a great example of using x-ray to confirm feeding tube placement. And if we really wanted to get fancy, we could do barium on this too. Uh, this is a black and white warbler. And what I did was I reversed the color scheme on the image. So I flipped what's supposed to be black to white. And that's one of the fun things about digital is you can blow it up and shrink it and focus on an area or flip the black and white. And sometimes with these super tiny birds, it actually helps me to evaluate them better because these birds weigh like 0.38 ounces. So sometimes if I flip the black and white, I can find a fracture of, you know, the clavicle or coracoid or keel more easily than if I didn't. This is a black-throated blue warbler, again, an approximately nine gram patient. And you can see it's definitely challenging to get that really beautiful contrast with these tiny patients. When I first started doing this 20 years ago, we all coveted a dental x-ray machine because you could get those tiny patients because the dental x-ray was meant for you know, the mouth. So it was better at getting good contrast on these. I think with these little guys, sometimes it's just, um, you know, making sure you don't have stuff like this weighted bag in the, in the view, sometimes collimating down a little bit to really get just the bird. Sometimes it's playing around with different settings. And sometimes it's just plain hard to look at this x-ray because the bird is nine grams. <laughs> so, you know, these guys fly into windows often too. And sometimes we need to see if they have a, a fracture in this little thoracic girdle. I can't do it on this slide, but what we'll do is we'll blow that up really nicely in the clinic and have a good look at it. And I couldn't not put in the juvenile bald eagle. Um, this year, Pelican Harbor Zebra Station got two uh, juvenile bald eagles that fell from a nest in Pembroke Pines that was breaking. First one, then another one. Um, they were being cared for at Pelican Harbor Zebra Station and the decision was made to transfer them up to Audubon because they had so many other eagles there and it was just gonna be a, a better overall experience for them to be with so many conspecifics and then also have that access to that huge flight cage. But uh, not only were we involved in stabilizing them and getting some initial x-rays, 
but ongoing, uh, there's a lot of work being going on to restore the nest for the eagles in the Pembroke Pines area to make sure that next year the nest doesn't fall apart because basically this mom lost her whole clutch this year because there's just so much overgrowth and not a good area and stable trees for her to, to build her nests on. So if anybody's interested in more information about that and how to get involved, that would be a, a separate conversation that I thought worth mentioning because um, who doesn't love a bald eagle? And this x-ray um, was you know, a screening x-ray that was done to evaluate the patient but I really want you to look at those feathers and think for a second, why do these feathers stand out so much more than any of the other x-rays that I've shared tonight? So if you've had a minute to think about it, time's up. <laughs> it's because they're all blood feathers. These are all brand new feathers growing in. And if you remember, the, the, the thicker, the more dense the tissue, the more white it comes out. So all of the other x-rays we've seen, the uh, feather shafts are just full of air but these feather shafts are all full of blood. So um, it really just kind of stands out and makes it a very interesting x-ray. Um, and then just to show an example of something that's not necessarily uh, orthopedic, but sort of soft tissue, this was a, a young squirrel that had a really bad swelling of the right hand and we wanted to make sure that it wasn't broken. So again, squirrel looks different than possum, obviously much different than bird, but you can just tell, you know, by the, the head and these, these teeth here uh, that it's not a possum. And on this right hand, there's just a whole lot of soft tissue swelling, but luckily for this patient, um, there was no actual broken bones in there. So after several days of meloxicam and probably some laser therapy, that swelling resolved and, and this baby squirrel went on to do great. Um, this little bump on the back is actually probably sub Q fluids that were given prior to the x-ray. And I've been thrown off by some x-rays I've looked at in the past where I didn't realize that sub Q flu fluids were given before and something was like not right. And then I realized, oh, okay, they got their fluids. So just another little fun fact. And then just to compare the, the squirrel to the possum, remember I said, if you look at the skull, they just look so different. Um, this possum was pretty normal. I think this little friend was getting an x-ray to make sure there was no spinal trauma there. So the positioning is not perfect because the animal was awake, but it was a youngster and it was like not using its back legs. So the idea was, let's just make sure that there's no glaring spinal fracture before we continue the rehab care. And probably this patient got better x-rays down the road if he didn't start using his back legs again. And then I had to throw in one of these guys. So you can think in your mind what species this is and what we're looking at inside. Um, so of course it's a snake and it's full of eggs. So some snake give uh, birth to live and some snake uh, pass eggs. It depends on the species, but I love a snake because their whole body is basically spine and ribs. They have like 300 ribs and a spine. There's no keel bone that it attaches to. Everything's loosey goosey. When they swallow a whole rat, those ribs just sort of expand to accept the food. I mean, it's just fascinating. They have the jaw that dislocates to fit in enormous things and be able to swallow it. I mean, if you really think about how exceptionally well-designed all of these animals are and how different they all are, super fun, but as a veterinarian and a rehabber, very challenging for us because you have to learn all these little nuances about every little species to make sure that you're interpreting the x-ray correctly. And then here's a, another fun one. So turtle gets its uh, screening rads for um, potential hook, which is sitting right here. But of course, why did the turtle cross the road? Bum, 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 to lay the eggs. So full of eggs. And we see this all the time when it's Time for the turtles to lay their eggs. They get hit by a car or, you know, they're looking for an easy meal and get a hook. And a lot of our x-rays, we end up seeing eggs on them. And then I had to throw this in there because their x-rays are just so cool. And even though uh, bats are rabies vectors species, um, they do get stabilized from time to time at Pelley Harbor because they are native species, wonderful species. Um, they really clean up all those mosquitoes for us. And here's a northern yellow bat, one of the more common ones in South Florida. Um, just little beauties. And there's the team busy at work in the clinic, looking at an x-ray, working hard, saving lives every day. 
So in conclusion, we have seen birds, mammals, reptiles. We've seen broken bones, ingested hooks, soft tissue trauma, normal x-rays. We've seen how x-ray can be used to check for feeding tube placement, IO catheter placement, contrast medium, and more. And of course, the mission is always to release these beautiful animals back into the wild. And because we live in Miami, we get to do lots of beach releases, which is the very, very best. So now it's time for any questions. Jessica asked, uh, or she said, thank you for a great presentation. Are there any conditions where x-rays should be avoided? Hmm. Um, I mean, I think in humans, there's a concern for you know, radiation, but in wildlife, most of the time, they're not having many, many x-rays done. And um, if they're not stable enough, you just don't use the anesthesia, but there's really not a time that you don't, it, it won't hurt the animal to do the x-ray. I think for time management, if they don't need it, then, you know, you don't do it. <laughs> but that's just because we see so many patients, anybody who's doing any rehab. <laughs> Um, Jessica asked, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the reason behind using la laser therapy or is it worth another webinar? Oh, well, the, the quick answer is laser therapy doesn't hurt anything and I've really only seen benefits from it. So um, it's basically light amplification, simulation, emission, radiation. So what it does is it sends these wavelengths into the tissue to um, increase oxygen flow, increase the healing process. Um, if you understand biology at all, it increases like ATP uh, cell turnover. So healing is faster. Um, there's rarely an indication where it wouldn't help. And again, it's just time management. I choose the cases that I think would benefit the most, but um, whether it's an incision after a surgery from a simple laceration repair to like an elective spay on a pet, to a swollen joint, to head trauma. Um, I think it really truly only helps. And I, I do have some testimonials that I wrote for a company about some cases with nerve damage where nerves usually take like six months to regenerate and repair. And I swear with the laser therapy, it was expedited tremendously. So any sort of nerve damage, I think it's really worth pulling out the laser. Yeah. Um, Alexandria asked, is laser therapy a primary therapy? Uh, it depends who you ask. <laughs> uh, some, some people think it's still like not scientifically proven enough. Um, it definitely has its place. I don't think that like in a head trauma, I don't think laser therapy alone is going to do it. I think you need to be using, you know, meloxicam or if it's acute trauma, IV mannitol to, to get that swelling down or, um, IV, uh, the um, hypertonic saline, sorry, that's the word I was looking for. Um, those things are much more, uh, if I don't know if effective is the word, but important and essential, and then laser therapy can just complement. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I'm asking, I'm actually an MD and mannitol and all those things that you mentioned we use in humans as well. And there is laser therapy that we can use for people as well with like joint pain or back pain and stuff like yeah. that. But it's the same thing in human medicine that it's not really evidence-based. So we use it as an adjunctive therapy. Um, so it doesn't hurt to do it just like you said, but you know, it, is it curing anything? We don't really know. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Like I have my testimonials, but you know, it wasn't uh, double blind studies or anything. Right. So I say I've seen good stuff. I don't think it hurts. And you know, if you have access, it's fantastic. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, a small the, question. Oh yeah. Um, so regarding the hooks, when they swallow them, you say you mm -hmm. use cotton. Why is it that you use cotton? because the cotton is super soft and the hook gets wrapped up in it. So we put the cotton inside a fish and um, they eat the fish. And then the cotton in the stomach doesn't like pass through right away. Like the fish gets digested, but this, the cotton stays there and the hook gets embedded in the cotton. And then because it's a foreign body for the pelican, they often regurgitate it. And um, I have no idea who was smart enough to come up with that trick, but it really does work often. Cool. So why wouldn't it just regurgitate the hook itself, knowing that it's a foreign object? Well, first of all, you wouldn't want it to because it would do damage coming up. Exactly. Yeah. Second of all, I think the hook sometimes gets a little bit stuck in the stomach. So when it starts to get wrapped up in the in the cotton, 
and the, the juices of the stomach are working because they're eating fish okay. and it kind of lets it exit. <laughs> if that oh, okay. Sense. I understand. That okay. That's, that's pretty cool. I yeah. don't think to, that maybe using cotton would be smart. Yeah. But so it this is- has to be cotton in a fish. You can't just like feed them cotton. So it's no. Like- yeah. Cause then they would not, that would, no, not a good yeah, ending. So cotton, <laughs> cotton fish. <laughs> okay. Thank you, by the way. You're welcome. I think VPL had asked if it was the same for human, but I think Alexandra kind of answered that too. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Thank okay. you everyone so much for joining. Um, if you're interested in being part of the team, we're always taking volunteers and internships so you can learn um, in the hospital all the work that we do in, and work with our veterinarians and rehab staff. Um, Dr. Schneider, thank you so much for the presentation. It was amazing. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and edit this video um, and we'll have it posted on YouTube by the end of the week and we'll email it to everyone so that if you want to share it or reference it you're welcome to um, but yeah thank you everyone for being here